Yo, yo, what is up? This is Rafael, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board, and I have my guy Sam Ferris on today. And in this episode, Sam is going to share with us his Big Board. And, you know, Big Board episodes are always a hit. So let's see if there's any surprises. Stay tuned. All right, shout out to each and every person that has made the NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I really appreciate it. Sam does, Richard does, Leaf does. We all appreciate each and every listen and, and just the opportunity to talk basketball and share our, our thoughts on this platform. So thank each and every person for making it your first listen of the day. All right, got Sam on. Sam, first of all, how are you doing? today and wait actually i should ask you where are you at i mean i feel like we both are on the move and in different places so are you are you at home today yeah today i'm at home uh live in salt lake city and you're in vegas which is where i was last week actually and uh, we were talking before we started recording that you got to watch a few workouts today that uh, got me pretty excited a couple guys that i or one guy specifically that we might talk about here in a few minutes that I'm very high on that you got to see work out today. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for, for when you get to where he's at. All right. So this yep. is your big board, correct? And which yep. version of this is it? Have you made like multiple versions? No. So this is the first one I've made post season, post college basketball season. Um, like before the college basketball season, I did a, a short one where I just, mentioned the guys that I was higher on and kind of my top five or 10, but I've gone out through like six tiers here. So I listed 38 guys so far. Um, and so this was kind of my first big one post-college basketball season. Okay. All right. Let's get right into it. So who is number one on your big board? So number one for me is Chet Holmgren. I was thinking today kind of to myself and someone actually DM'd me asking this, but I think I would pretty much take him number one in just about every circumstance. Really? All right. Explain why. Cause I don't have Chet number one on my big board. You don't? Okay. No, yeah. I'm, I'm a Ben Carroll guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't completely disagree with that, but my reasoning for having Chet number one is a mix of a few different things. Number one, the productivity that we've seen from him, both at the high school level, but then at Gonzaga last year, I, I just thought he was one of the best players in college basketball as a freshman. And it's not just the box score stats. It's how he affects a game, especially on the defensive side of the ball with his rim protection. And I also think that he's going to be a scalable player. I think how well he's able to scale defensively in terms of guarding a little out on the perimeter is a question mark still, but just his effect defensively. And then he's the rare guy that can protect the rim, but then space the floor. And on top of that, I've always been just really high on all of his just intangibles. The kid, though he's skinny, is he's tough. fierce. Like yeah. he's <laughs> tough. He is tough. I just love his mentality. I love his intangibles. I know that he's going to put everything into it to become the best player he can be. And so I just love the whole package and I'm a little bit less worried about the weight thing. And maybe I'm factoring in a little bit of, of what I saw from Evan Mobley last year, where I was like, uh, is he going to be that effective playing the five? You know, I thought he could only play the five, but when a guy's that skilled and that good defensively, I think to a similar extent, though, I don't think he can switch and guard the perimeter as well as Mobley. I still think in today's NBA, he can play both the four and the five. And so I'm not pigeoning, pigeonholing him into just being a straight up, you know, old school guy that can only play the five. All right. So if you have Chet number one on your big board and number one on your top tier, do you see him as a franchise star or do you see him more as a complimentary star? So there's a couple different ways you could look at this because I don't see him as the number one scorer or the number one offensive player for a championship level team, but I certainly think he can be 
like a top two player on a team, if you pair another good score next to him, I think he can get to the point where he carries enough value offensively and he can really prop you up defensively as well. And so, no, I don't think he's going to be the leading scorer or the go-to scorer or even the best player offensively, but I think he's going to be a great defensive player that can fill gaps, that can prop up a defense, and that in the end, I do believe he can kind of be However you want to look at it, I think, like, you, I could see him being the second best player on a good playoff team uh, at his peak. Do you have a comparison, like a player comparison? I have one in mind, but I, I want to hear yours. I mean, there's... This is the hardest one, part about Chet. <laughs> yeah, there, there really isn't one that's that great because, you know, there's, like, the poor Zingas thing. And maybe poor Zingas before the knee injuries, but now poor Zingas just doesn't move well enough. And then, like, so maybe a cross between he and Mobley would be kind of, like, the closest thing to me. But that's kind of the hardest thing with him is there isn't really one that that, that is, you know, that great or that accurate for me. What about you? Marcus can be with three-point shooting range. Sure. Yeah, if we can add other attributes on, I, I like that one. Yep, that's uh, – and I think, like, with the ball handling – I mean, he can handle the ball, but I don't know how well he'll be able to handle in a half-court set. I think yeah. in space, mm -hmm. he'll be able to handle, like in transition, but in a half-court, I think because of his lack of strength, I think he'll just kind of get bumped off of his spots. Agreed. All right, number two. Who is number two on your big board? And you have you have it broken down in tiers, so who is yep. the only player outside of Chet in your tier one? Jabari Smith is in that tier for me as well, just behind him. So I guess it'd be kind of more like a half tier because I did say I'd take Chet in just about every circumstance. So they're not completely equal for me. It's like maybe a half tier down is where I'd put Jabari Smith. Okay. And what makes you have Jabari in this tier as opposed to the guys that you have in your second tier, which is Paolo Bancaro, Jaden Ivey, and Shaden Sharp? What makes Jabari ahead of them as far as in tiers? Yeah, so the obvious comparison is with Paulo, but to me, what separates him is number one, the age. Jabari Smith is very young, but then the scalability, both offensively and defensively, where the thing that worries me just a little bit with Paulo is I don't see him as like a multi-positional defender. I see him as more just like a four in the NBA and... So therefore, if Paulo doesn't reach his ceiling offensively, then that kind of caps his his value because he's just, I don't see him being like a plus defensive player because of that lack of versatility. I do see that with Jabari. I think he moves his feet really well at six foot 10. Um, and then offensively, he's just an incredible shooting prospect for a guy that's, that's six foot 10. And so that is valuable at that age. Now, the worry is, or the improvement points is to what level or what level is he going to get to as a ball handler? Because it, everyone knows the two point shooting hasn't been good enough from him. He doesn't really create much for himself outside of one or two bounces. And so he and Paulo are kind of like complete opposites, but similar positional. And so it's kind of like, what do you value there between the two guys? All right, before I get into the questions, I want to talk to you about athletic greens. And I had mentioned in yesterday's podcast that I came home from traveling and I had this huge box on my counter that my wife showed me and it was Athletic Greens. And I gave it a try and it actually was very helpful and beneficial. I had did a lot of traveling. And one of the things that Athletic Greens helps support is your energy. And for me, I was lacking energy because I was spending three weeks in Europe, one week back in the state so I could attend my child's doctor's appointments. I wanted to go to the doctor's appointments with my wife. And when I say it was wearing me down, spending three weeks in, in Europe making 12, 13 hour flights. Once I started taking athletic greens, it helped out with my energy, like I said, but it also helps out with your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, recovery, focus, aging, all of the above. So you're probably asking what is Athletic Greens? And I tell you this much, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free or gluten-free. Athletic Greens contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while it still tastes good and it supports better sleep quality, which is what I needed. And the recovery supports mental clarity and alertness. 
it's the one it's one of the best things about athletic greens is that it uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant production testing and third party constant productions from third party testing so it is time for you to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition one scoop just one scoop in a cup of water every day that's it no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health so to make this easy athletic greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin d and five you heard that right five free travel packs with your first purchase all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NBA network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NBA network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow. Has my guy, Sam Ferris on. He is giving us his big board. I saw when he posted it. Uh, I think it was yesterday when he posted it. So I guess it'll be two days by the time you hear this podcast. And I just kept seeing it retweeted all over my timeline. So you've <laughs> developed a nice following on social media. So that just is a, it's a testament to how people feel about your, your knowledge of the draft. So props to you. It was, like I said, it was just all over my, my timeline. All right. So let's get into your tier two which features Paolo Bancaro, Jaden Ivey, and Shaden Sharp. All right, I'm going to start off backwards. Shaden Sharp. Yep. He has as many points and rebounds as me and you. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yeah. What makes you put him in your tier two over guys that produced in college? Yeah, so it's just – at that point, it's kind of a balance in risk reward. And I just think his potential value, his upside as a wing player with skill on the ball, like his pull up is very projectable and he's an elite athlete. So if you can find that guy, then to me, you got to take him. And so I can't get high enough that I put him above those other four guys I have above, above him. But I just think his ceiling is much. I don't know how much more valuable. I shouldn't say much, but it's certainly more valuable than the guys that I think I have in the next year. So just like with the rest of the draft, it's kind of that balance in the risk reward. How do you balance that? And to me, his upside is so valuable that I, I won't drop him past um, the five spot where I have him right now. Okay. Jaden Ivy, you have him at number four. Um, and yep. all right, here's a question. What makes Jaden Ivy four? And then a guy like Johnny Davis, who you have at number 10. Why, why such a, a, a gap between those two? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've always been a Johnny Davis guy. I think I was one of the highest people on him coming into his sophomore season. True. We were on him um, early. But to me, you have to look. I was. But you, to me, you have to look first at what do these prospects have that cannot be taught. And Jaden Ivey's athleticism, his speed is like nuclear level. It's elite. And that's something that you just can't quite say for Donnie Davis. I was going back and watching um, some more Jaden Ivey film today and just some of the dunks and the speed and transition. Like we can quibble about different parts of his game. And that's what in- what's interesting is there's still some holes to his game that he can fill, especially in the mid range and the decision making coming out of pick and roll. But you just can't teach the speed and the bounce that he has. And so that's why that, that's why I've got him uh, number four on my board. I cannot wait to see him with NBA spacing. That is going to be yeah, – I know. That's going to be something to see. I mean, there's been some comparisons to John Morant, um, which, I mean, I think Morant is, is, is a better passer and playmaker, but I can see just the, the – nuclear speed i was cracking up when you said i haven't heard that used to describe a player speed <laughs> but i mean it was it yeah. was accurate and and yeah i mean i can just see him just thriving in the open court or, or with uh with nba spacing all right so at number three we talked about it a little yeah. bit earlier van carroll is my guy i mean i'm not saying it like i know him but i am yeah. riding or driving the van carroll bandwagon and uh, um what are your concerns about Van Carroll outside of what you mentioned as far as um, that on the defensive end, not being able to play multiple positions? Are there any other concerns? Uh, you could say the outside shot, but you could say the three-point shot is a concern for so many prospects. It's 
oftentimes a swing skill for most of these guys. Uh, the thing that I see with him is, yeah, he's got the skill to play on the ball. Like, I could see him becoming a primary ball handler. But if he is your primary, like, the way I view it is I just don't know how good your offense is really going to be if he's your primary. Like, I see him as a – the view that I have of him is, like, a little bit better of a version of, like, a Julius Randle. Um, now, he can pass the ball a little bit better, but just the play style, the physicality, and the way he's built uh, reminds me a little of Randle. Uh, I do think he'll be better, but I just think that if he is your primary, your offense might be capped at a certain level, and then I just don't see the value with him defensively. So kind of that lack of, you know, whatever term you want to use, scalability, portability, is a little bit my issue with him. And then offensively, he's kind of got to play on the ball a lot because he's not like a great three-point shooter, or at least isn't right now. And so I just don't know how good your offense is going to be if he's your primary option. See, I, I am. I mean, I don't want to go too much into it because I've talked about it numerous times on podcasts. I think that he is 2018-19 Blake Griffin. I see him at his peak 24, 10, and 5. I do think the three-point shooting will, will come around. I mean, he shot over 50% from over 40% from three in, in the tournament. And uh, I think that you know, Duke just didn't maximize his gifts. And I think that if he has a creative coach, I mean, I look at like a guy like Scotty Barnes, what Scotty Barnes was able to do offensively in the NBA. And I think that Van Carroll has more offensive gifts than, than Barnes. All right. So let's talk about your, your next tier. It's the guy that I like Jalen Suggs. You have, I'm sorry, Jalen Duran. Wow. <laughs> Jalen Duran yeah. at, at number six which you're higher than him than a lot of people. I mean, I think I've seen him anywhere from six to like 15. And, and why are you h- higher on Duran than, than others? Yeah, this is where the draft gets kind of interesting. So it's a little more eye of the beholder here. Like I'm pretty confident in my top five and I'm pretty confident in having Jalen Duran six. Um, let's start. We've been doing some comparisons for different guys. For me, um, I see Dern as a mix of Robert Williams and like um, prime Derek Favors. But like, I think that player can be the third best player and can kind of lead the defense of like a championship level team. And so I value that. Like, I think Robert Williams could have been, if he had stayed healthy a little longer, could have been in the running for defensive player of the year this year. Um, so that's kind of the player comp that I see there is a mix again of favors in his prime before the injuries and Robert Williams. Um, the thing that I, I say and bring up with people with Duran is you have to remember that he he's like the youngest player in the draft, right? He's He should just now be coming into his freshman season. So the thing that I think about with him is as a thought experiment, just imagine him coming back in playing a second year at Memphis right now and he'd still be 18 when he's when next season started for him as a sophomore just think how dominant he would be like he would be ridiculously good next year and so that's the way that I kind of put it in perspective for myself and I think he's just a little bit more of a sure thing at this point I know what I'm getting with him I believe he's an above average I think he's a good starting center a top 10 starting center in the NBA and I'm pretty happy to get that at six or seven in this year's draft class. Yeah, I, I agree. Here's a, here's a Rafael Barlow fun fact. When you mentioned Derek Favors, mm-hmm. Derek Favors is only 30 yep. years old. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> He's only 30 yeah. years old. So when you say in his prime, you know, usually 30 is kind of like supposed to be like your prime years, but it seems like yeah, yeah. Derek, Fav- I mean, this is how long Derek Favors has been in the NBA. He was traded for, Peak Darren Williams <laughs> and peak Darren Williams seems yep. like it was yeah. so long ago. So long and, ago. and um ironically, Derek Favors is currently on the Oklahoma City Thunder, which is the team that I want to see Jalen go to. That is my ideal perfect fit for him, outside of if you know they end up with the a, a top three pick. But I would love to see him benefit from playing with Josh Giddy and just I mean, you know how Giddy yeah. just loves to find guys that run the floor. I think he'd so, be able to get at least 10 to 12 points per game 
just off of activity and being whether it's offensive rebounds, whether it's cutting, running the floor, a couple of free throws, I could see him mm-hmm. averaging maybe 12 and eight as, as a rookie. And then, you know, Giddy led the Thunder in rebounding. So I think that that uh, they, yeah. they really need some help on, on the offensive or, or just on the glass, period. All right. Next on your – who is number seven on your, your big board? Another the guy that's a little bit of a surprise, I think, to people – uh, it's Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor is who I have at seven, actually. Yeah, I, I, I like him. I mean, I had Kendall Brown as high as five at one point at the beginning of the season. And Sohan yeah. is definitely higher on, on my board than um, than uh, Kendall Brown right now. And then you have A.J. Griffin and Benedict Matherin. I'll get to those in a second, yeah. but we got to talk about built bar and simply because i mean summer is coming and with summer you're going to need some food on the go and built bars are the perfect snack to take with you on your family vacations throw them in your bags put them in your kids backpack make sure that everyone has a bar so you are fueled for your summer adventures and the best thing about the built bars is that they are healthy first and delicious or either you can say they're delicious first and healthy second either way you get a combination of healthy and delicious. You don't have to sacrifice delicious food for health. And with Built Bar, like I said, you get both. All Built Bars are 100% real chocolate, and that is including the Built Bar Puffs. If you haven't tried the Puffs, I'm telling you, you are missing out. And people are going crazy over the Puffs that have different flavors like banana cream pie and even churro. So could you imagine tasting this marshmallowy puff that tastes like a churro? And the good thing is they are only 140 calories. Built Bar makes sure there's something for everyone. My favorite flavor is the white chocolate cookies and cream, but most Built Bars are 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein, which if you compare that to a candy bar, that's usually around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Go to Built.com, check out all the flavors, whether it's banana cream pie, raspberry, double chocolate, many more. They're all delicious. They have new flavors coming out all the time. Check them out at built.com. Again, go to built.com. And if you use the promo code LOCK15, you will get 15% off of your next order. Use the promo code LOCK15 at built.com for 15% off. Once again, this is Rafael Barlow, Sam Ferris, giving his big board. And sometimes when we have these big board episodes, there's just not enough time. I mean, I would love to spend two to three minutes talking about each prospect all right let's talk about aj griffin so aj griffin Mm -hmm. is someone that i mean i thought he was a top 10 pick coming into the season then there were the concerns about his injuries and then for him i think that he's a lot to go top 10 as long as the medicals work out in his favor yeah what makes you have A.J. Griffin over Benedict Matherin? Now, you have him at 89, so it's obviously not too much of a difference. Yeah. But was there was there one little thing that made you put Griffin over Matherin? I would say probably the combination of, like, the length, kind of the physical profile of Griffin, where at six foot six, uh, different from a lot of other freshmen, where he's already very well built, but also has the long arms. So he's got that nice physical profile that you'd look for. But mostly just the shooting as a freshman had one of the best shooting seasons for a freshman, especially at that size at like six foot six that we've seen in a long time. Like with about two weeks left to go in the season, he was literally shooting 50% from three on heavy volume. And he did kind of go through a little cold spill at the end, but it doesn't take away just from how ridiculous of a shooting season he had. So the question with him is just what level of athleticism and burst he can get to, because to me, it's pretty clear that he's not returned to where he was pre-injury before that knee injury had in, in high school. And so even if he doesn't get all the way back, still the, the physical profile plus the shooting is going to be valuable, but it, if he's going to be creating off the bounce and if he's going to reach his ceiling defensively, a lot of athleticism and pop he can get back to. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent, Matt. At one point I felt like he just did not miss threes. Like when you say that he was no, shooting that ridiculous yeah. rate, but I, I feel like, and this is just my opinion. I feel that because he was brought along slow 
and Duke was already kind of in their system by the time he kind of was thrown, got into the starting lineup. I feel like he played like a, a dumbed down role in a sense. I think that he's more than just a shooter, but that was the role that he, he played at Duke simply because they were kind of already clicking by the time he, he got healthy. So I'm curious to see if there's more to his game than he was able to showcase. And then as far as Matherin, I like Matherin a lot. I, I do think that at the minimum, Matherin is going to be a three and D guy, but if he can work on some creativity off the bounce, I think that the sky is the limit for him. Do you feel like he yeah. he has the potential or the upside to be a, a shot creator off the dribble? Yeah, I think so. I think I don't think he's going to be a number one option. I don't think he's going to be a lead ball handler, but I could certainly see a realistic path for him to be the number two guy playing off of another, another scorer. And one thing that I... I loved that I saw from him this year was he really improved in the pick and roll. Uh, so he, like he didn't run pick and roll at all as a freshman. And then in his sophomore year, he did it very well. I think he ranked like somewhere around like the 90th percentile in synergy. And what stood out to me was his ability to find the roller in pick and roll to make that pass found Coloco on a ton of lobs, especially in the second half of the season. So to see his progression there, off the bounce, running pick and roll, even hitting some of those passes to the lob threat. Like to me, that showed that there is a little bit more there. And I like that improvement trajectory that we've seen from him. But also, like you said, at six foot six, really good shooter, really good movement shooter. Like to me, he's got kind of a special ability where he can run off a screen, be facing away from the basket and rise and kind of square up to the basket midair and hit shots like that. So even if he doesn't develop a ton on the ball, like his ability to move off the ball and hit shots at his size is still going to be valuable. I agree. All right, now let's get into like, this is the segment that I've been wanting to get into. All right. This is, I mean, I haven't even prepared you for this, so I'll beware. These are guys that are, (laughs) that you are lower and lower on than the consensus. And I'll just mention some names. The one that stands out the most is Keegan Murray. You have him at number 11. Yeah. The floor is yours. So it's funny because another guy I was higher on, like the two guys I was higher on coming into this year as returners were Johnny Davis and Keegan Murray. Now I feel like I'm a little bit lower than the consensus on Keegan, which is kind of funny. But the... The thing you have to think about with him is he is a little bit older, so he's going to be 22 before he starts his rookie season. And I'm a guy that values age. I value youth. I think that's really important to factor in, something that I've learned. And so that's a factor. Um, The other factor for me, which is similar to what I talked about actually with Paulo, is I view him more as just like a four defensively. And in terms of, you know, if you're not going to be the star on-ball guy on your team, it's just really important in today's NBA, especially in the playoffs, that you can be versatile defensively. And so that's a little bit my question mark with him is I don't quite see that on the defensive side of the ball. And then my point with him offensively is I think he relied on just kind of overpowering guys offensively, using his strength, um, feasted kind of on smaller guys. Like if you look at his synergy profile, it's a ton of post-ups and that's where he just like buried guys that, he was kind of frankly more athletic and just stronger than, and like, I, I don't see him creating a ton just in terms of his skill level for himself on the ball. So like, I still, it's not like I have him super low. I have him 11th. So still a lottery pick. I just don't quite see the defensive versatility. And I also don't see a ton of just unbelievable self-creation on the ball offensively either. Makes sense. All right, here's another guy. And uh, I am in Vegas now, and I just spent the day watching him work out. I was blown away. And you have him about where I, I, I will have him on my next mock. Blake Wesley. He's been, like I yeah. said, incredibly impressive. What makes you so high on, on Wesley? Yeah, he's a guy that I think what happened was he had a really good first half of the year. And then his efficiency did fall off a little second half of the year. So he kind of fell off some people's radar. But as I've gone back and watched the film, I've got him at number 15. He's one of the guys that I, that 
you know, if I were drafting, I would be betting on him in like the middle of the first round. And I think he's going to end up being a riser. You and I were talking about this before we started recording. I think he's going to be a bit of a riser in this process. I'll start with the defense. I think people don't, I think I'm higher on him defensively than others with, you know, his physical profile at 6'5", but lanky strong with like a 6'11 wingspan. And that's what kind of separates him from other combo guards in this class, whether it's Ty Ty Washington or, or Jaden Hardy, for example. Like, I think he's going to be a good defensive player. And he was, the activity rates were good for him in college as well. But he's also got some shake. He's got some creation ability off the bounce. Um, the one area he needs to improve is his finishing at the basket. But I think he's a good athlete. I think when he gets to the NBA, works on the finishing craft. That I think that's going to be an area he improves. But he's got the tools. Like, he can legitimately create pull-ups for himself. And again, I just like the size. I like the physical profile for that combo guard uh, that he's going to play. So I would gamble on him. He's a guy that I would target in the middle of the first round. And I think he's got some serious on-ball creation upside. Yes, yes. And like I said, I've seen it live and in person. And I was talking to Joe Obunasar, who is the legendary trainer at Impact. He's worked with Kevin Garnett. I mean, if you get a chance to go to that gym, even look at the like wall of fame, it is, it's like a who's who. And he said the same thing about Blake's finishing. And he, his theory was Blake was not a guy that played a lot of high level summer basketball, like didn't play EYBL or anything like that. And he just went from playing high school straight to college, where he was used to being able to finish over guys with ease. And um, so he felt like some of it was his weight. I think I think he told me he came in, um, he finished the season weighing 181, and he's up to 190 now. So he thinks that will help. And But, I mean, he's raving about him. And it's coming from someone that has seen the best of the best work out. And so um, I, I think that's a, a, a big testament to Blake Wesley. All right. So there's, I mean, we're, we're running out of time here. I'm just going to name a couple of guys that you have on your top 38 that are totally different. All right. Let's, let's go with Vince Williams. You have him at number 35. Some people don't even have him in their top 60. What makes you high on Vince Williams? It's the statistical profile with him. Like to me, he's kind of more the analytical guy where I'm trying to factor that in a little bit more this year. Uh, just everything checks out, the steal, the block rates, the efficiency. I think he is a guy that's going to be kind of a plug-and-play, similar to what we saw from guys like Desunmu and Austin Reeves last year, where he's a guard with some size, with good feel that can shoot, and he's pretty good defensively. Does he have a crazy high ceiling? No, not really, but I think he's a guy that can come in, plug-and-play, can be in a rotation from day one, just due to to his readiness due to the feel and due to good size for a guard. Yeah. I mean, that's a name that I, I think that a lot of people are going to be shocked by. And I mean, we're running out of time here. We're going to have to talk about this on another episode, but you have Kennedy Chandler at number 37. So it's like you and Richard, AKA Mr. Mavs drafts are, are lower on Kennedy Chandler than I am. And uh, maybe all three of us have to get on a, a show so we can debate it out. Thank you so much. Once again, thank Let's you for making it. Sounds good. Thank you for making the NBA Big Board your first listen of the day. Now make your second listen or another third listen. The Locked On NBA podcast from the first jump ball of the playing tournament to the last possession of the finals. The Locked On experts take you deep inside the playoffs with insight and analysis affecting all 30 teams. I'm Rafael Barlow. He's Sam Ferris, a.k.a. Mr. Draft Dummies. And we are out.